Thank you. And I want to thank the organisers of this session. I'm delighted that we have a session on climate literacy and I hope that continues. So I work for an organisation called the Union of Concerned Scientists. For those of you who may not heard of us, we've been around for about 40 years talking about some of the world's most pressing problems, one of which is climate change. We have over 400,000 supporters and members and I invite you to check out our exhibit hall booth. I think it's 2616 in the exhi exhibit hall. I'd like to present some work that I've been doing over the last year. I've been working with Bjorn Grigholm, who worked with us over the summer. He's from the University of Maine. And we're really interested in how the human brain works. We know that humans have been relating stories to each other for thousands of years. So we know that one of the tools for climate communication is to tell stories. We also know that at the centre of communication is emotion. So we take things on when there's an emotional component. So we've tried to bring that into our work. And we know that information is not the problem here. We've all known that for decades. So I'd like to go over some of the work that we've done. Uh, and it's very visual and it may follow on from some of the questions we've just had. So we know that no one country, no one city, no one state is going to deal with climate. We know it's going to be a collective effort. And this is a photo from Bridgeport, Connecticut, where communities were brought in to talk about sea level rise. That community engagement is incredibly important. And it's something that we're trying to do as a non-profit organization, is to figure out how do you talk to those communities. So we ran a couple of focus groups. We brought together 30 to 40 people uh, in a room for a day and we asked the question, what happens if you don't go straight to climate change and global warming? What happens instead if you present the information as a climate impact such as sea level rise or wildfires or drought? Because we know that climate change is a polarizing partisan issue in this country. What we found from these dialogues, and they were community dialogues with diverse audiences, is that in fact if you go straight to the climate impact, you're much more likely to convince people that we need to act on this problem. So we go, we, we kind of sidestep the polarizing debate over whether climate is happening or not, and we tell people in these communities about the impacts that they're already seeing. They already know that sea level is rising, and they're much more likely to agree that we need to act on those if you don't polarise them. We've based a whole strategy on this uh, over the last couple of years. We've done a number of climate impacts uh, reports on tidal flooding, on landmarks that are at risk and on wildfires. And I'd like to, to lead you through some of the material uh, so that you can see what can be done if you don't lead with climate change. We just released a report called the Encroaching Tides Report. And in this report, we've used uh, information and data from NOAA and also from the group Climate Central. We've looked at a very short time frame. We've looked at projections in the next 15 and 30 years. And we chose to drill down to locations on the East Coast. And the, the whole purpose of this report was to bring it home to people that we're already seeing changes in climate. These people know that in some places twice a month, they know that they're having tidal flooding just with high tide. So in this report, we didn't focus on storms. We didn't look at storm surge. We didn't look at hurricanes. We just looked at the tidal flooding that we're already seeing today. It's a very data rich report. Uh, we know that the uh, projections, or sorry, the historical information from NOAA suggests that over the last 40 years, some places have quadrupled the amount of tidal flooding. NOAA brought out a report in the summer, which was called nuisance flooding. And it looked at minor flooding in many parts of the United States. What we've done is focused on the East and Gulf coasts. We've taken the minor and moderate flooding levels and we've looked historically, and we've also looked at projections using the National Climate Assessment Intermediate High Scenario. What that shows is that sea level rise projections for just the next 15 years by 2030 is that two thirds of the places that we looked at 
will more than double the number of flooding events in that very short period. We also know that by 2045, under the intermediate high scenario, that tidal flooding could increase tenfold in many places. We think that a lot of these towns and cities are not ready for this. So one of the aims of the report is to increase awareness of a very slow creeping change that we may see. But most importantly, we want to tell stories about this. So we want it to be real to people. So we highlighted uh, half a dozen different places and really drilled down into those places, found locals who are willing to talk about this and created uh, animations and videos highlighting their stories. It's a very graphic rich report as well, but it's two dimensional. So it's static, there are lots of graphs, bar graphs, schematics. I worked with Bjorn Grigholm to see if we could bring these up off the page and onto the internet. So one of the questions that came up is what's the next step? How do we actually move forward with this data? How do we translate in this, this to animations and videos? So one of the tools we used is Google Earth, and we looked at uh, the flooding in some of these areas. We know that we'll see flooding, or we currently see flooding about twice a month in half a dozen places. By 2030, that will be more than a dozen places along the East Coast under that intermediate scenario. I'll go on to the next one. Uh, and so we're using Google Earth to, to show how these places change. We also have looked uh, using a software called Blender, which is an open source software, is to try and explain the mechanism. Now we know that if you could press play. we know that information is is not going to convince people, but there is a need for people to understand some of the science. And with this graphic, this animation, we're trying to explain that with six inches of sea level rise by 2030, or 12 inches by 2045, the normal high tide will be at today's moderate flooding level. And by 2045, the normal high tide will be at the moderate flooding level. So we're trying to convey to people that the whole baseline is changing. And then we've gone one step further. We've gone onto the, these communities and found people that are dealing with uh, tidal flooding on a daily basis. Uh, we've put together a short video, which I'd like to share with you, that's really telling the story of what it's like to cope with that. The ocean rises, streets submerge, neighborhoods flood. There is no storm, there is no wind, there are only the tides. And when the tides rise highest, they are flooding communities up and down the East Coast. From Miami to New York, Norfolk to the Jersey Shore, it has simply become a fact of life. Tidal flooding on this island uh, happens uh, definitely once a month. During normal tidal flooding events, which occur with a full moon down here, at this end of the block here, you could see the water up to my knees if we had an east wind, you know, and that would just be a normal occurrence. Any cars that are here during the, during the event uh, will get flooded, destroyed. The children can't get, get off the block in time for school. The tides are reaching higher, and tidal flooding is expanding because sea levels are rising. And sea levels are rising faster as global warming heats up the planet. Hotter temperatures are melting glaciers and ice sheets into the sea, even while global warming is heating up the ocean itself. Water, when heated, expands and sea level has got nowhere to go but up. So most of the sea level rise we're, we're seeing the last uh, 50 years, which is eight and nine inches in this area, is due to the ocean getting warmer and getting bigger. We're seeing significant impacts of sea level rise already here in South Florida. And that's not something that was happening 50 years ago. And so we know that that a new flooding is connected to sea level rise. And we anticipate with the projected flooding, we're gonna have more days of flooding than we're gonna have uh, days where we don't have flooding. Over the next 30 years, sea level could increase a foot or more in many East Coast locations. 
With only a moderate increase in sea level, dozens of communities could flood at least 24 times a year, or an average of twice each month. A growing number of locations could flood 100 times or more every year, some more than 200 times, including portions of Washington, D.C., Atlantic City, and Miami. And when storms occur, the higher tides will only magnify the risk of severe coastal flooding events. All along the East Coast, communities may be at risk as the encroaching tides render areas effectively useless. I think that regardless of your, your total position on this, uh, that there is you know, no way to avoid the fact that we are seeing more significant events in terms of uh, flooding uh, tidal issues. We have to get together, everybody on the same page, and take measures that are doable measures. Globally, we have to restrict emissions, which we're all trying to do, but not very successfully. Uh, we've got to cut down the carbon in the atmosphere because that's the prime cause. People often think about climate change impacts, especially sea level rise, as something that's going to be in the distant future. But all the current research shows that it's something that's going to be well within our lifetime and certainly in the lifetime of our children. And so um, there is no future date where you can take action. You have to take action now. So making it real for people, bringing it home. I will just briefly look at one other video, one other report that we've done. We've looked at the Rocky Mountain forests at risk, and here we were looking at three different issues. One is the insect infestation, which has happened, so the bark beetles that are wintering and now attacking trees. One is the severity of wildfires, and the other is drought. And so these stresses are, are really affecting the forests in the Rocky Mountains. We've created infographics on this before, so looking at how the wildfire season has tra changed from, from five months to now seven months a year, just in the last 40 years, and how the, uh, the number of wildfires has increased. Uh, but we've also started telling the stories of the scientists that are working uh, on this. So I'll just play a, a short clip and you can watch this later. I live in a forest, I work in the forest, I've grown up in forests, and to me this is my whole world. And to see so many trees that I love dying is very disturbing. There's no precedence for this in modern times. The Rocky Mountains rise as the backbone of America, stretching from New Mexico to Montana and beyond. Today this iconic landscape is changing in ways so profound it will transform the region for generations to come. The forests are currently dying at a rate that we have not observed in at least 500 years. <coughs> Vast expanses of trees, once green and lush with life, now rise as brown and gray stands of skeletal snags. In the last 15 years in the U.S. alone, an area of forest larger than Colorado has perished. So just a small section of our work. Uh, thank you everybody for listening and, and please look up our website for more information.